Bakewell turned his attention to sheep. Before Bakewell came along, the standard breed was the Lincolnshire, and they were sheep with big bones and rather scrawny rough wool. He changed all that. He bred them to produce the new Leicester breed, and these are the descendants. These are Leicester long wools. And if you look, they're like barrels on legs. Just look at the width of that. It's absolutely terrific. There's a mass of meat on here, and yet they've got very fine bones. With the sheep, he not only used the selective inbreeding that had been so successful with cows, he also controlled the way the sheep mated. He made quite sure that the ram serviced each ewe only once, and what he did was to keep the ram in a field, and then he brought the ewes one by one. Now, by doing this, he managed to get his prize ram to service twice as many ewes as had ever been done before. So, he, of course, he got twice as many prize lambs. Bakewell's breeding methods also speeded up the rate of growth. Sadly for the sheep, they were now ready for the table in just two years instead of four. Unfortunately, in his 60s, his health began to fail. He weighed 16 stone and he was only 5 foot 9 inches tall. He must have been fat enough to look like one of his own sheep. He was rather sad and said he was afraid his life's work would never be finished. He died when he was 70, but his work lives on, as 70% of the world's sheep today are descended from the new Leicester varieties, genetically engineered in the 1760s by Robert Bakewell. I've come to the village of Goadby Marwood, a few miles north of Melton Mowbray in Leicestershire, to celebrate an extraordinary man. He was rector here from 1779 until 1786. He fancied himself as a poet, and he invented a variety of things, from interlocking bricks to a cure for putrid fever. But he's best known for the power loom. His name was Edmund Cartwright. Edmund Cartwright was born on the 24th of April, 1743, in Marnham in Nottinghamshire. He went to Wakefield Grammar School and was sent to Oxford to study for the church. While he was at Oxford, he published a very, very long poem called Armina and Elvira. It went through several editions and it was praised by Sir Walter Scott and a few other people. Now, on the strength of that one poem and a couple of mediocre ones, he later called himself the father of poetry and said that all later poets were his children, which I reckon was really a bit presumptuous. In 1784, Cartwright went on holiday to Matlock in Derbyshire. And while he was there, he went to Cromford to see Richard Arkwright's cotton spinning factory. Arkwright had invented the water frame. It was powered by a water wheel, and it allowed an unskilled girl to spin 96 cotton threads at the same time. Later, in the pub in Matlock, Cartwright was talking to some cotton men from Manchester, and they were saying that if there were a few more mills like Arkwright's, there'd be so much cotton thread that it would outstrip the weavers. They wouldn't be able to keep up. In fact, the people who were making the thread would have to export it, and that would be very bad news. And Cartwright said, oh, well, Mr Arkwright will have to invent a weaving machine, won't he? And they said, nah, impossible. Nobody could possibly do that. But Cartwright wasn't so sure. He'd heard about the automaton, a machine that apparently played chess and beat people who played against it. And he said, if you can make a machine to play chess, then surely you can make a machine to weave cotton. But the chess-playing automaton, called the Turk, was an elaborate hoax. The cabinet seemed to be full of complex machinery, but in fact there was a very small, very skilled chess player hidden inside. When Cartwright patented his first power loom, he'd never actually seen a weaver in action. And when he went into the mill, he was amazed at how simple the whole process is. Basically, you have two sorts of thread. Down here, you have the warp, which goes all the way from one end of the cloth to the other. And then there is the weft thread, which goes across here, and it's contained on the bobbin inside this shuttle. So what you have to do is three things, just three things. First is the shedding. That's making this hole, this tunnel, between the warps. Depending on the pattern you're weaving, various groups of warp threads are pulled up or down, trapping the weft between them. Second is the picking. You have to yank on this piece of string to throw the shuttle across. And third is the beat-up. You have to pull this to yank the weft up against the rest of the cloth. So it's 
shedding, picking, and beat up. Shedding, picking, and beat up. So on. Very simple. And it was the shedding, the picking, and the beat up have never changed since the beginning of weaving until the present day. And it was those three things that Cartwright had to mimic with his power loom. His first power loom was patented in 1785, but it wasn't a great success. It was slower than a good hand weaver, and it needed two hefty men to operate it. But by 1788, his machine had perfected those three simple actions, shedding, picking, and beat up. This is a power loom, and I'm pedalling to supply the power. Cartwright moved up to Doncaster and built a mill with looms powered by a water wheel. Cartwright got into real trouble, though, when he tried powering his looms with steam. Grimshaws of Manchester built a huge mill and they were going to install 400 looms. But thousands of weavers could see their jobs going and Grimshaws had threatening letters. And when only 24 looms had been installed, the factory burnt to the ground and no one else dared try it. In 1793, after all his trouble at mill, he left weaving for good, but his power loom lived on, and they're still used today. I've come to Cartwright's home in Goadby Marwood to try out another of his ideas. In 1795, he invented and patented these, interlocking bricks. Now, his idea was to prevent fires. The point is that houses were made with timber supports and the timbers were flammable so houses kept catching fire and he thought if you could have interlocking bricks like this then the whole house would be self-supporting and non-flammable. These were the complicated shapes he needed to make an arch and if I done it right then it ought to be self-supporting. A normal arch needs support at each side, or the ends would be pushed out and the whole thing would collapse. Now, the ultimate test. Look at that! Fantastic! Absolutely amazing! It was a fantastic idea, but unfortunately, the bricks are very complicated and therefore very expensive to make, and the idea didn't catch on. He retired to a farm and lived there peacefully, still inventing things. In 1823, he dreamed up an engine powered by gunpowder, but luckily he died peacefully before he had a chance to blow himself up. He left dozens of inventions, almost all useless, but one that he'll be remembered for, the power loom. I've come here to Wing in Rutland to celebrate a brilliant experimenter. He made the most sensitive and accurate apparatus for measuring the pull of the Earth's gravity, the heat coming from the planet Jupiter, and even the speed of a lightning stroke. His name was Charles Vernon Boys. He was born in 1855 and studied basic physics and chemistry at the Royal School of Mines. From an early age, he tried to explain the science of everyday things around him. In 1881, he became fascinated by spiders, and he wrote his first scientific paper on the influences of a tuning fork on the garden spider. Now, here is my garden spider, Araneus diadematus, to its friends, and here's its web. And normally, this sort of spider hangs upside down in the middle of its web like that to wait for its lunch to come along. But boys found he could fool it by using a tuning fork, like this. And what he did was to bash the tuning fork to make a note. He touched it on the web, and what happened was that the spider instantly slewed round, he said, to face the tuning fork, rushed across and tried to eat it for its lunch. Now, obviously, it couldn't make much impression, but it never learned. So if he touched it again, it would rush over and try and eat it. And every time, the spider would try and eat the tuning fork. And then Boyce discovered that if he waited until the spider was at one corner of its web, perhaps it had had something to eat over there, and he then made a note and touched the web, say, here, the spider didn't go straight across, as you might think. Instead, it went to the middle of the web first, and then it turned round 
and when it faced the fork it then rushed up and tried to eat it again. So clearly the spider was actually using these radial spokes of the web as direction finders to look for its food. His dad was the rector here at Wing Parish Church, so Charles would have popped in on Sundays for a visit. The rector kindly let us in to recreate some of Boyce's best work. In 1888, Boyce invented a really sensitive heat detector. The heat made an electric current flow through a copper loop suspended between the poles of a magnet, causing the loop to twist a fine wire. The more heat, the more it twisted. But for really tiny amounts of heat, even the thin wire was far too stiff. He needed a new sort of fibre, finer than a spider's web, yet stronger than steel. And eventually he settled on quartz. This is a piece of quartz glass, a rod about two millimetres diameter. And his idea was to melt it and then stretch it out very quickly. First, he needed to draw out the fibre. He tried using rockets, guns and even electricity to make the quartz fibres before finally settling on the bow and arrow. Ever the experimenter, he spent weeks scientifically testing the wood to find out which was the best for his bow and the best material for his arrow. He anchored one end of the quartz to the bench and the other end to the back of the arrow. I reckon that's good and soft now. Yeah, look at that. Now, let's see what I've made. Oh, yeah, look. Here, here is my fibre. It's very, very fine. It's very bendy. Absolutely amazing. Very flexible indeed, considering I started with a stiff quartz rod. When Boys did this, he was able to shoot it 90 feet. And he made quartz fibres that were less than a hundred thousandth of an inch thick. Using the quartz fibre, his first heat detector could register the heat of a candle from one and three quarter miles. He later used it in his dad's back garden to measure the temperature of the planet Jupiter. He pointed a telescope at Jupiter, but instead of looking at it, he put his detector where his eye should be. Throughout his life, Boys was driven to build intricate machines to measure the unmeasurable. When he worked for the gas board, he made the most accurate gas meters ever. He photographed speeding bullets, and in 1900, he built a special camera to photograph lightning. He waited 28 years for the right storm to come along, and then used it just once to calculate the speed of the lightning stroke. Sir so Richard Paget summed him up when he asked, why, oh why, did boys always tackle a problem other men would shirk, yet solve the task and make it work with means that no one else employs? The answer is, boys will be boys. This is muscle. Muscle is protein, just meat if you like. And inside the muscle there are masses of little fibres which have to contract when the muscle does work, you see. Look, they're all contracting so that I can lift this massive weight. We knew all that at the beginning of the century. What we didn't know was the detail of how those fibres contract. The person who solved that mystery was born in this very house in Newhall near Burton-upon-Trent, and her name was Emmeline Jean Hansen. Jean Hansen was born on the 14th of November, 1919. She was raised on a diet of science, music and literature and excelled at all three. Jean's research career started in 1948, when she went to King's College London and began to investigate muscles. She looked at muscle fibres under the microscope and what she saw looked a bit like this, a series of dark and light bands. At the time, no one knew exactly what the bands were or the details of how they worked. That's what Jean wanted to find out. What was interesting was this was what they looked like relaxed, but when they contracted, it was only the white bands that got shorter. The black seemed to say the same, relaxed, contracted. She couldn't understand this at all. It was a complete mystery, and she couldn't get any further with just her microscope. What she needed was a new technique. Jean went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology near Boston to learn how to use the newfangled electron microscope. It could magnify the muscle fiber a thousand times more than her old microscope and it showed her the exact detail of how a muscle contracts. This is my muscle machine. 
This whole thing is a model of my right arm. Up here is the hand, and then the forearm, and my elbow. And what I'm going to do is a little bit of waving, like this, because I do quite a lot of that and I need to practice. Now, in order to wave, I need to lift up my hand. And to do that, I need to contract, that shorten, this muscle, the bicep. And then to put my hand down again, I need to contract or shorten the tricep, and my hand goes down. Muscles are actually made of two sorts of protein, actin and myosin. These white bits here correspond to filaments of actin. Under the microscope, it's these long, thin filaments that form the light bands. And the brown ones correspond to filaments of myosin. They are the thicker filaments which form the short, dark bands. They are the ones that do all the work. Watch what happens when I contract my bicep. Now, did you notice that these cogwheels go whistling round? And what's happening is that the, they are attached to the myosin filaments and they're actually pulling their way along the actin filaments. It's fascinating. People used to think that when the muscle shortened, both proteins must shorten as well. Gene showed that the dark myosin didn't change length at all, but rather crawled along inside the actin. It's called the sliding filament theory. Now I need to get my hand down again, so just watch the tricep contract. Wow, look at that power! Did you see those cogwheels turning? They were actually pulling the filaments of myosin in between the filaments of actin. Now, of course, this bit here corresponds only to a tiny bit of one muscle fibre. And a real muscle has thousands and thousands of fibres all lying together and all pulling together, and that is why I'm so incredibly strong. Jean stayed in the United States for only two years. Then she came back to England and King's College and went on working on muscle fibres until she died in August 1973. Her friend and colleague, Sir John Randall, said of her, Servitor in modo, fortitur in re. In other words, sweetness in method, strength in action. In the 1920s, when aircraft were made of wood and cloth, my next hero was an RAF apprentice, and he revolutionised air travel by inventing the jet engine. His name was Frank Whittle. Frank Whittle was born in Earlsden, Coventry, on the 1st of June, 1907. He was a troublemaker at school, known for forging sick notes from his mother. He studied physics in his spare time and became obsessed with flying. His engineering skills were honed in his father's small factory, and at the age of 16, he embarked on an engineering career with the RAF, with the dream of becoming a pilot. Whittle soon became a flying legend and joined a spectacular aerobatics team in the 1920s. He pushed his biplane to the limits and soon realised that the plane of the future would need a new propulsion system. He was a 21-year-old cadet when he wrote his landmark thesis. In it, he said, to fly fast and far, you have to fly high. He knew you couldn't do this with a propeller, so he proposed a turbine to produce a fast-moving blast of air. This jet of air would be the basis of his jet engine, which he first patented in 1930. The jet engine relies on a principle dreamed up by Isaac Newton and written down in 1687. He said that forces operate in pairs. That is, when you get an action in one direction, you get an equal and opposite reaction. Let me show you what I mean. I've got here a boat with a catapult mounted on it. You see, with a rubber band here to power it. And I'm going to put in the sling here a couple of marbles so that when I cut the string at the front, these marbles will be shot out of the back of the boat. Now, I'll put it in the water there, and then I just need to slash rather quickly with this knife and then get my hand out of the way. And you see that? The marbles are thrown out of the back, and the reaction pushes the boat forwards. Unfortunately, you can't run a jet engine on marbles, but you could use lots of tiny marbles, like the molecules of a gas. So I've got here 
a gas-powered boat. That is, it's a boat with a balloon on the front and a valve. And when I open this valve, all the air in the balloon will come shooting out of this jet at the back. So let's just see how that works. I need to open the valve and then push it in the water. Open the valve, push it in the water. And there, it's going forward in just the same way. Action and reaction. But it wouldn't really be very practical to have an enormous inflated balloon on the front of an aircraft. What Whittle had to do was work out a way of getting all the air that was round the aircraft rushing out the back of the aircraft at very high speed. Whittle submitted his idea to the Air Ministry, but their experts said it wouldn't work. Two friends knew that Whittle was on the right track and raised the money to start Power Jets at the Ladywood Works in Lutterworth. After a few near disasters, his first engine was running. But as war loomed, he was a long way from the jet-powered plane. He went back to the drawing board, here at Brownsover Hall, where he lived and perfected his engine. Whittle's office was in this very room. Now, it looks fantastically complicated, but in fact, the idea of this engine is very simple because it has only one moving part. At the front here, there's a compressor, which is really just like a fan. And when you switch it on, you get a nice blast of air. And then immediately downstream, there was the turbine, which is like a windmill. It picks up the air from that fan, and it spins round, like that. Now, his was obviously more efficient, because the whole lot was contained within a tube, so the air didn't all escape out sideways. Now, his next really cunning idea was to mount the two on the same shaft, like this. So they're actually coupled together the compressor at the front and the turbine at the back. And then, when you switch on, the compressor drives the turbine and the turbine drives the compressor. So, as this goes faster, it forces the compressor around faster and pulls more air in. Now, it can't work on its own because that would be perpetual motion. And to get it to work, he needed more energy. He got the energy by burning fuel in this gap, in the gap between the compressor and the turbine. Then out at the back, the exhaust was a jet of very hot, and very fast gas, and that was the jet that Whittle wanted. Whittle confounded his critics, and on the 15th of May 1941, his jet plane made its first flight. It must have been a bit of a surprise to see a plane whizzing about with no propeller, but it was no surprise to Whittle. One of my colleagues sat me on the back. He said, Frank, it flies. And in the tension of the moment, I rather rudely said, that was bloody well what it was designed to do, isn't it? Because it was wartime, Whittle had to hand over all his ideas to his competitors for free. His company was finished. Eventually, he was rewarded with a knighthood and a hundred thousand pounds, a tiny fraction of what the jet engine was worth. I want to find out what it feels like to have jet power. So I've mounted a real jet engine on my speedy wind cheater, and it's back here, you see, just behind all the gears. And as I said, it's got only one moving part. This is it, the rotor. And in the front here is the compressor. And if you look, you can see the compressor there in the front of the engine. And then round at the back is the turbine. And if you look in here, you can see the turbine in the engine. And that's what pushes the compressor around and pulls more air in. And right in the middle here is where all the fuel is burned. This is Bruntingthorpe Aerodrome, where Whittle made his first flight in a jet-powered plane. What better place to take my first ride on a jet-powered cycle? It's a really smooth ride. There's absolutely no vibration at all. Of course, with an ordinary engine, like in a car, the pistons are going up and down, but with this, there's only one moving part. It's just smooth revolution. And, you know, it's like riding on a, a cushion of air. Sorry, that's all the heroes I've got time. This is the parish of Keir, 14 miles north of Dumfries. And I've come here on my bicycle to Courthill Smithy because it may well have been in this very building that my next hero invented the bicycle. His name was Kirkpatrick Macmillan.
Kirkpatrick Macmillan was born here in Kia in September 1812 and became a blacksmith like his dad. He probably went off to work in a foundry in Glasgow. Then he worked for the Duke of Buccleuch, who had a nice little place up the road, before returning to Courthill and taking over the business when his dad retired in 1851. Now, it says on his gravestone and on this plaque here that the first bicycle was built in this very place about the year 1840. And it says on that plaque it was built in 1839. So there is a certain amount of doubt about the invention of the bicycle. We do know that in 1817, a German chap called Karl von Reis patented a thing called the hobby horse, which had two wheels and a saddle in between, and you sat on it with your feet on the ground and pushed yourself along. And they used to wear out their shoe leather and indeed the iron they put in the soles of their shoes. But everyone who's anyone had to have one. It was very popular. However, the next stage in the development of the bicycle did require a real leap in the imagination. The thought that you could balance on two wheels and propel yourself with some sort of mechanism. The first pedal-driven bicycles were supposed to have been made in the 1860s by Michaud in Paris. They were called bone shakers or velocipedes. The ordinary or penny farthing came along about 1870. There's no mention in the official history of Kirkpatrick Macmillan. According to the plaques, though, this was where he built the first bike, and this is it, or at least this is a modern replica. You can see it's got a huge solid wooden frame, wooden wheels, iron tyres for surviving on the roads, and steering, well, much like a modern bicycle, really, with handlebars, but it doesn't steer very much because the wheel runs into those iron rods there. Now, the back wheel is huge and, again, wooden, and it's got these cranks here which turn round as the wheel turns. And they're actually turned round by the action of the feet on these treadles down here, which go backwards and forwards instead of round and round. And that's a slightly unusual motion to get used to. Now, the question is, can I ride it? Well, get a stride. I'm going to give a good push off and then push with my right foot and then try and treadle. It's a very peculiar action. <laughs> it's extremely heavy. The steering's very limited, but I do seem to be going forwards. Macmillan didn't bother to patent the design and indeed seems to have done little with it. But others saw his bike, copied it and sold the copies for six or seven pounds. Apparently, Gavin Diel's copies became so well known that for years he was regarded as the inventor of the bicycle. Well. There may be some controversy about who really invented the bicycle, but I'd like to salute the ingenious Scottish blacksmith who built the powered velocipede, Kirkpatrick Macmillan. I've come to these Arctic wastes to tell you about a pair of brothers whose work revolutionised the way we think about temperature. The younger laid the first cable under the Atlantic Ocean. He set up the world's longest running experiment and he found that there was a temperature below which you could not get. Nothing could ever get colder. 